Hey guys, my name is Dice Rowan. Today, we're gonna be taking a look at a horror movie that brought us parasitic slugs from outer space. Night of the Creeps was written and directed by Fred Decker and was released on August 22nd, 1986. It tells the story of campus teens under attack from alien parasites that take over your brain. With the help of a detective, a teen and his friend must face off against the slimy creatures. This review was requested by Arturo Pacheco and was voted on by you guys. So without further ado, this is my review of Night of the Creeps. The movie starts off aboard the Nostromo. Oop, sorry, wrong alien. Whatever kind of species this is seems to be attempting to save something while being pursued. Do I need to censor this? Does naked alien ass count, Susan? Well, whatever was in that vessel has successfully been sent to 1950s Earth. Mmm, yes. I can smell the hairspray from here. Pam, played by Alice Cottigan, and Johnny, played by Ken Heron, are enjoying their evening together when said vessel crashes nearby. So, Johnny goes to investigate while Pam stays with the car. Johnny finds the mysterious space debris, and whatever was being kept inside finds a new vessel in him. On the bright side, this could have gone in the Dreamcatcher direction. Over the radio, Pam hears that an escaped mental patient with an axe is on the loose. I would make a here's Johnny joke, but he's in the woods dealing with one of the worst tapeworms ever right now. Fast forward to the year 1986 and we're introduced to two of our main characters. Chris, played by Jason Lively, and JC, played by Steve Marshall, who just so happens to have nearly the same level of snark and sarcasm as I do. Chris becomes immediately infatuated with Cynthia, played by Jill Whitlow, and, begrudgingly, he and JC follow her into the beta house so that he can talk to her. But since Chris is too much of an introvert, JC decides to play ultimate wingman and approach her on his behalf. Unfortunately for JC, Chris decides that the best way to have a chance with Cynthia is to become a beta. Too late. After speaking with the frat house leader Brad, played by Alan Kaser, Chris and JC are given a task. It's pretty simple, really. All they have to do is retrieve a dead body for a prank. Careful now, we're getting into Logan Paul territory here. Upon their arrival at the Institute, the boys discover a particularly significant room with a particularly significant individual inside. You heard of freeze-dried coffee, right? Well, this is like a freeze-dried human, a corpsicle. He's not exactly wrong, I just don't like that phrasing. Since there are no other obvious choices and no security here, Chris and JC decide to take Johnny Boy for their task. Slight hiccup, but it seems that Johnny may not be totally deceased. After the two flee, this becomes David Paymer's problem. Chris and JC have a bit of a tiff, where JC actually makes some good points before they pillow fight and make up. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. Tom fucking Atkins. Or Detective Ray Cameron, who's been called out to investigate the apparent murder of the guy in the lab. In case you had any doubts, Cameron isn't fucking around here. Also, there appears to be a bit of a discrepancy, as one body that Cameron was told about is missing. It just so happens that said body is wandering around the campus and scaring the shit out of Cynthia. Naturally, the police and Cameron are called, and they discover that this is indeed the body that went missing in the lab. Only now, it definitely seems to be dead. Cameron's concerned that given how the corpse looks, it could have met the business business end of an axe. Kind of like how Pam ended up after meeting the escaped psycho years ago. Speaking of psychos, Brad and his frat bros catch up with Chris and JC the next day. You know, nothing says I'm about to end this nerd's whole career. Like Chad, hold my mini backpack. Brad isn't exactly happy that last night's events make it seem like Chris and JC pulled a prank with the body. Like he had told them to do to begin with? Now given that Cynthia not only heard that that body thing was Brad's idea, but also witnessed that he's an ultra dick, she sides with JC and Chris. But the police arrive to bring the two in for questioning since the janitor spotted them running out of the university building. Screaming like banshees? Chris explains what happened, and this doesn't exactly ease Cameron's concerns that something spoopy is going on. Meanwhile, the lab assistant's back and providing years worth of needed therapy. While Cameron investigates this latest mysterious body, Cynthia visits the boy's dorm to talk to them about another incident involving a resurrected cat at the sorority house. She may want to ask about a guy named West. 
JC leaves Chris and Cynthia alone for some bonding time while he goes to the restroom. Unfortunately for JC, the alien slug infested janitor went there too. However, he does discover that apparently these things' weakness is fire. Cynthia asks Chris out to the formal and things are looking pretty good for him. Until Detective Cameron brings him to his place for some alcohol and traumatic event revisiting. He tells Chris that he had a high school sweetheart, but they broke it off and he became a police officer. During a call, he and his partner found the seemingly dead Johnny and the most definitely dead Pam. Later on, Cameron hunted down the murderer and killed him. The thing is, he disposed of the body on the land where the house mother's home sits now. So you know what that means. <laughs> the police search the area and find the decomposed yet animated axe murderer wandering around nearby. And Cameron is prepared with his 12 gauge. You son of a bitch, I already killed you. The next evening, everyone is getting ready for the formal. The recording that Chris finds while getting ready explains JC's absence. Apparently, one of those slugs got to him, so JC went to the furnace sacrificing himself. Chris goes to Cameron telling him about what happened, and what creatures have been causing all this weird shit. So he and Chris go to Dick Miller for a flamethrower to combat the alien slugs. At the same time, a bus full of frat boys gets totaled when the driver swerves to avoid an escapee from the pet cemetery. This, of course, leads to every one of them getting infected. And an infected Brad almost gets Cynthia, but Cameron and Chris arrive just in time. However, they have even bigger slug infested problems. Oh, I got good news and bad news, girls. The good news is your dates are here. What's the bad news? They're dead. So, Chris teaches Cynthia how to use the flamethrower, and together, along with Cameron, they fight against the zombified student body. There are some slugs that escape to the basement, though, where, for whatever godforsaken reason, one of the girls was storing brains for a project. So Chris and Cynthia evacuate the house, and descend into the basement to find Detective Cameron, already there with some gasoline. He essentially tells them to get out while he ensures that the mega slug pile will be destroyed. Detective? Thrill me. If horror movies have taught me anything, it's that joining a sorority or a frat house is never worth it. Here's the twist though, Detective Cameron made it out of the blast carrying some of the slugs who flee to a nearby cemetery. Is this a tie-in with Return of the Living Dead or the essence of a sequel? Either way, the spaceship from before arrives to search for these slugs. And with that cliffhanger, the movie ends. The plot of Night of the Creeps is rather unique. It pays homage to the cheesy old 50s and 60s black and white horror movies, while also adding that 80s goodness that so many of us enjoy. It manages to write a predictable story, but throws in some twists you might not have seen coming. It has fun with its audience, and gives some smart winks to horror fans throughout. The effects are essentially all practical and rather impressive. Yes, you can spot a fake dummy head pretty easily, but detail and care was put into each of the effects that we see. The makeup for the zombies looks pretty good, and the zombie axe murderer especially is terrifying. The slugs, though simple, serve their purpose quite well. It'll make you second guess the next snail you see. I rather like the characters, they're all unique and fun to follow along with. They fit certain stereotypes of horror, but the movie is very much aware of that and plays with it. You can tell that Tom Atkins had fun with his role of Detective Cameron. He gave the character heart and didn't just go with some overly serious cynical cop type. Jason Lively and Steve Marshall had great chemistry and played off each other well. I particularly enjoy JC being more than just the goofy sidekick. Alan Kaser did a good job of being a right asshole, who essentially deserved what he got. And Jill Whitlow played the love interest that was more than just a pretty face to look at. I mean, come on! She was wielding a flamethrower against a horde of slug-infested undead, all while wearing heels. Something else that I liked was how Chris's arc was going from a rather shy and insecure individual to a brave character willing to fight back. There was a nice bond that formed between him and Cameron, and I like to think that he took after the detective a bit after the events of the movie. The atmosphere is what I would like to call comfortably 80s, but it also mixes in some of that 50s B-movie tone. So because of that, this movie has a very interesting vibe about it. It's all pretty believable in the context of the story. For those who grew up with the old 
old black and white horror movies. Night of the Creeps feels familiar, yet with a fresh take and self-aware humor. Barry Devorzan created the score, and did a very nice job of conveying the mood of each scene. It's got a sound all its own that fits well with the movie. With all that being said, I'm giving Night of the Creeps 7.5 out of 10 bloody thumbs up. It really does do both 80s cult classics and 50s B-movies justice. It takes the whole zombie horror movie plot and adds a creative twist to it, with the alien parasites. It lives up to the expectations you have when you read the title and the tagline. It is rather campy, but it is very much aware of that, and leans into it. It may not have been highly successful when it first came out, but people have caught on to it in the following years. It deserves its place as a favorite in the 80s cult classic category. I would recommend Night of the Creeps to zombie film fans, people who love cheesy black and white horror movies, people who like Slither or Shivers, and anyone who wants to see Tom Atkins being peak Tom Atkins. So I hope you enjoyed this video, if you did, give it a like to let me know. Don't forget to leave a comment down below telling me what you thought of this movie. And if you have any suggestions for horror movies you would like to see me review in the future. You can support the channel through my Patreon, where you would also get early access to videos like this. Also don't forget to share this video to help the channel grow and subscribe for more videos like this. See you later. Thrill me.